You're listening to the Player Lear Podcast, where we talk about board games and game design. Today's guest is Sam McDonald, who is an amazing designer. His first game was Architects of the West Kingdom, and he's worked on all of the West Kingdom games. Uh, he's also worked on Circadians, and I think we had an awesome, awesome conversation. Thanks for listening, and enjoy. I'm very happy to have on Sam McDonald, uh, who's been working on, or he, who's been working with uh, Garful Games. His first games were Architects of the West Kingdom, the whole West Kingdom trilogy, then Circadians is a project that he did uh, by himself, not co-designing. And he's just been producing some really, really great games. So I'm very happy to, to finally meet him and talk to him about game design. Uh, how are you doing, Sam? Thanks, Ivan. Yeah, it's a privilege to be on here. Doing pretty well. <laughs> awesome. Uh, could you tell me a little bit about what you've been working on right now? You've, you've been doing game design for like four years where are you, what stage are you at now? Mm. I've only just uh, jumped into it uh, full time, quote unquote. But uh, I've picked up actually a teacher aiding job down the road, so it's not quite uh, full time. But this last few months, I've been working on three different expansions alongside Shem for three different West Kingdom games. So I wonder if you can guess what they are. <laughs> There's only three games. <laughs> Uh, I don't know how much more I can say about them. Like, I, I don't think I can say the names. I don't think I can talk too much about the mechanisms, but I will say that the Paladins one, if you like Paladins, it just takes it up a notch. Like, it gets even heavier, even crunchier. I, I kind of feel like I've, I'm, I haven't i mastered Paladins yet, but I feel like um, I'm getting there. And so this expansion is almost designed for myself just to confuse myself again so i have to relearn the whole game again and try and figure out what's good again um and that's a lot of fun for me like i, I like uh, being perplexed by a game and its systems and how everything works together so i've been spending a bit of time on uh expansions including fixing one of the ais from the first game that we worked on architects uh it's it's a good ai uh for solo mode but I mean, I designed that when I hadn't played any other Solitaire games ever before. And so I've learned some things along the line. And so, um, yeah, working on fixing that. But the the big project that I'm working on at the moment is the sequel to Circadian's First Light. I'm working alongside one of my best mates who actually lives in Italy. So we're 12 hours apart, uh, time zone wise. And if you like Circadian's First Light, you might not like this game. And if you don't like Circadian's First Light, you might like this game. They are quite different. There are still some of my own kind of um, general, my own kind of flair, the things I like in design is in both of those games. Like there is a lot of engine building and things like that. But this is a big dudes on a map asymmetrical battle game. And it's got six different asymmetrical races and they are quite asymmetrical. Not quite root level, but it's getting there, that kind of thing. So that's been taking up a lot of my time, having heaps of fun uh, playing with friends on Tabletopia. And um, yeah, that's been cool. Uh, could you tell me about working remotely with, uh, you said you're co-designing it now with somebody in Italy. Uh, how does your process yeah. work? Yeah, so um, we're kind of just figuring it out as we go, figuring out, you know, you do need to share work, but it also makes sense for someone to take on a whole task and they do that whole thing. So um, Zach, my friend who I'm working with, he's doing a lot of the implementation for Tabletopia. So I'll come up with all these different, well, we'll together come up with all these different changes and then he'll upload it onto Tabletopia. I haven't even touched um, that kind of editor system on Tabletopia. He's done it all, which has been amazing. We, after a play test, we'll stay on the phone for about an hour and we'll jot down all of these different changes and things that we think need, we need to keep an eye on things we think we need to change right away mm -hmm. and and then so we'll do all of that i'll think about the game as i go to sleep that night for him it's during the morning and then he'll message me through the day and i'll wake up and there'll be all these texts and i would have maybe thought about some of the same things in my sleep as what he's been messaging me about which is cool uh 
I jump on Adobe Illustrator, make the changes to the files, and then he'll I'll send them to him and he'll chuck them on Tabletopia. Now, some of that is a little bit of double handling, but that's just what's working for us so far. So yeah, I think just get to know the person that you're working with and then see what works for you together. Yeah, and could you tell me about the first Circadians game? You worked on it by yourself, right? Um, yeah. And before that, you were working with Sham, and now you're, you're working with uh, a, a different designer. Uh, could you tell me about how different it is working by yourself versus uh, working with other people? Yeah, I think I prefer co-designing, and that's just to do with my personality. Like, if there's someone else who is excited about the game, like, I mean, really excited to the point where they take ownership, like a co-designer, then it just helps to get things done. You get to kind of uh, be carried along by their energy, their momentum, and same thing uh, for them with you. So I, I really like that. I'm a really strong extrovert, meaning I love just working with people, working together. Um, it also, like when I work with Shem, we kind of cover over each other's uh, weaknesses or he covers over my weaknesses. I don't know about me covering over his, but... Um, yeah, he is very good at streamlining a game, like taking out things that aren't needed there, uh, making the rule book much easier to read and interpret, you know, making the teach a lot easier. And so I tend to add stuff to games. So Circadian's First Light was a bit of a challenge. It actually was developed quite quickly. Um, I think that was just because I didn't really know better. <laughs> so I, I wasn't as obsessive about the um the the balancing i wasn't as obsessive about all the different factors in the game i just wanted to see this thing um become something cool and then when shem had a look at it he was like wow this is quite close to ready he offered some really really good development advice um so he did still did some development um and yeah we i did a lot of my play testing for that game solo so i designed um yeah, because there's eight different variable player powers and I designed the solo mode early on in the piece so that I could test each of the characters, the variable player powers, up against the solo mode. Um, and then I could get a really good range of scores, see if they were about balanced and averaging around about the same scores. And so I think that's how I managed to do the game really, really quickly. It was because um, the solo experience quite accurately mimicked the multiplayer experience. Uh, could you tell me about working on solo modes specifically? Again, that's just something we sort of stumbled into. Um, we did it with Architects, and I think it was just because everyone else was doing it or everyone else was starting to do it with the Euro games. It's nice to be able to say one to five on the box. <laughs> and And for me, I just wanted that design challenge. You know, I just wanted that. It's kind of like programming. If you're, mm -hmm. if you're designing a solo mode with an Automa deck, you're designing a deck of cards or an algorithm, basically, that would um, tell the bot how to play the game and how to score well and how to be competitive. And so that was a cool little challenge. Can I design a deck of cards that is competitive with a human player who's intelligent? And, of course, you've got to make the bots cheat a little bit <laughs> to, make, to make them work. But, yeah. Um, so... I've picked up some things along the along the way with, with solo designing. The first thing that I do is I try to, you have to know the game well, firstly, mm -hmm. and then I try to note down all the different points of interaction in the game. So all these different points where players would normally be competing, competing against other players. The first one, the most obvious one, is with points at the end of the game. You want to have a winner. And so I like to have a bot where the bot can win or the bot can lose and you can win or you can lose. Some bots uh, beat your own high score and that works for some people. That's totally fine. So you note down all the different points of interaction. So if it's a worker placement game, you know, there'll be blocking mm -hmm. things like that. And then you need to make sure that the bot in some ways um, interacts with you in all of those areas. It doesn't have to be exactly the same as a human player. For example, with Paladins of the West Kingdom, there's this draft of tavern cards where there's a certain number of cards that are going to tell you what workers you can have this round. The easiest way to do this interaction in solo mode was just reveal one less card each round, and then you have one less card to choose from than what you would in a normal two-player. 
And so that was the cheap way to simulate <laughs> that interaction, but it kind of works, right? Mm -hmm. And you still kind of feel the crunch and the, the tightness. Yes. So, um, so yeah, working continue. with, yeah, yeah you, you said on cir circadians that you have v these variable player powers. When you designed that solo mode early on, you probably didn't know the game as well as, uh, you know, you were kind of learning about the game as you were playing, I'm assuming. Uh, how, how do you feel adding in those uh, variable powers? Did, did you first find the like kind of core of the game and then start changing things? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, uh, you know what? I don't remember exactly the timeline, but I think we probably did have a sense of the core of the game before designing the powers because otherwise it's just a nightmare, uh, which is what I'm finding out with Circadians 2 because with Circadians 1, the player powers are very important and they're very, they have a big effect on the game, but you could play the game without them. Whereas with what I'm working on circadians too, you need them. Like it's fundamental to the game that there's asymmetry, which just makes it a nightmare to balance from the start. Um, yeah. So I think with circadians one, to answer your question, we did sort of understand what the game was like, where the core interactions were while designing the player powers and designing the solo mode. Yeah. Let's move on to when you, when you get feedback from other players, say play testers or at conventions, uh, what do you look for? A lot of what I look for is maybe before they even say anything, what their like their body language, how they're enjoying the game. Notice if there are certain things in the game that, that wasn't intuitive for them. Notice if there were certain things that they were frustrated by. You can pick a lot of those things up. And then often they will tell you afterwards as well, like if something was frustrating or something wasn't clear or sometimes they think that they deserve to win and they didn't get enough points for the strategy, that sort of thing. Mm -hmm. But yeah, I, I'm, I'm just looking for their general impressions, how they found it, um, ways that I can clean up the gameplay, make it smoother to teach, those sorts of things. How, how, did, how did you feel about that like kind of overnight success and w w were you ready for for uh, that big feedback from that very first game i mean yeah i was blown away really with the, the feedback the architects got you, you could never have expected it you know mm -hmm. um but at the same time we knew that we liked the game we knew that we had so much fun when play testing and so I was just hoping that other people would have as much fun around the table with their friends with this little game that we put together as we had had in playtesting. And this is something, this isn't to answer your question, but there's something I want to say that to all game designers out there is try and enjoy the moment. Like when you're playtesting your game, I know that you're doing work and you're looking for uh, flaws, you're looking for faults, you want to fix things, all of that. And that's really important. But try and enjoy that time you spend playtesting as well because you're probably not going to play the game as much uh, once it's done. It just, that's just how it happens, right? And so those were really special moments. We would play Architects with um, two or three different people and we'd play like three or four times back to back. And, and we'd finish the first and second and third game and we would be excited about the fourth game because – there was this kind of group meta, the way that we play the game that developed. And we started to understand how the other players wanted to play the game. That's something you don't really get when you just play a game once every month, once every two weeks or so. So yeah, it's a really special moment. Anyway, back to your question. As you can tell, I ramble. No, it's fine. <laughs> so I hope that's okay. It's, it's um, completely fine. Yeah, so the success of Architects, yeah, it was, I was humbled, blown away, stoked, and... Um, because I never really went into this wanting per se to be a successful designer, even to be a full-time designer. With Architects, my goal was just to design a game that me and my friends would enjoy. Mm -hmm. And then it wasn't the success of Architects which kept me going, but it was how much I enjoyed the process, as I was talking about before. I loved working with Shem and I loved designing a game. And so it naturally led to designing the next game together, Paladins. Just because we enjoy that, we enjoy the challenge of designing something that we want to play. And um, thankfully, other people out there, there's some other people out there who enjoy playing what we enjoy playing. And so they've been enjoying our creations also, which I'm really, really blessed by. So thank you. Yeah, I'm, I'm so happy that you brought that up because I, I really think that finding that 
bliss in in the process itself like i always feel when when i'm starting out a game like there's always a bliss in that first idea uh when when you you can kind of feel get the feeling of of the game uh, i don't know if, if if it's like that for you but when i start off designing a game when i get that first idea i get a kind of feeling that i want to get to and then mm. i try try to look for that and with with every playtest there's something that you you can find like li- little nuggets of uh of 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 the right path so to say of, yep. of, of where you want to finally get to and i think it's so important to have those uh moments keep you going cuz otherwise it's kind of easy to put yourself down cuz it's not going to be per- perfectly uh in tune with what you had uh imagined yeah. at first but you're you're trying to get there and those little moments where where you you're finding you're finding the game essentially or something that just keep keep me going whenever I, I i try and design a game uh which brings me to to like my next question for you have you ever abandoned a project have you ever felt that you you can't uh finish it it's it's hard to answer that question because maybe <laughs> but if i say yes i have then that means i really have given up on these projects you know if i tell you on a live podcast not live if i tell you on a, a podcast that the whole world could see that i've given up on my baby then i really have and so i'll say that there's like three or four of my um designs that are on the shelf mm-hmm. and um they haven't been put to death yet and maybe they should but yeah uh, okay, there's 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 at least one that is dead, and I'll tell you about it. It's um just a silly party game that I designed kind of in one afternoon, and it turns out there's another game called Welcome to the Dungeon, which does mm-hmm. something a little bit similar. But I liked what Hanabi did, where um, players can see everyone else's hand, but they can't see their own hand, and um, I I basically just designed this silly little push your luck game where there was this, uh, the theme is you're at a restaurant, right? And this is something that I've done with my friends. So this is how the theme came on. And there's a, a meal, a plate that's put out in front of you. They, they say it's a uh, chicken tikka masala or something. And each player in their hand is holding a hot sauce and it's got a value of how spicy it is. And um, they are either going to um, play a hot sauce down, face down so they can't see what they played that's going to add to the dish or they're going to pass. And the last person standing has to effectively eat the dish. And so they're going to reveal these cards, figure out how, how much heat there is, heat there is, and that affects their health. And if the, if the dish ended up being way too hot, then um, they would lose. But if the dish, if they could handle the dish and they could eat all the hot sauce in the dish, then they would survive and they would get some money and points. And um, there was a little bit of betting that went on. And it was a really fun little game, but um, I think my problem with games like that, and I think it's a problem with how I like to design games, is I wanted to keep adding layers of complexity where a party game like that doesn't need them. And so I was never willing to say, yes, I'm happy with this how it is, because I wanted it to be deeper, Mm -hmm. um, but then that just kind of goes against the core of the game. So (laughs) I, I think that game is dead, but it was a little bit of fun while I was working on it. I, I think that's kind of why uh, what you said about making games deeper, I think that's why you and Shem make such a good team because it, it's, so, it's so nice when you have one person that streamlines and tries to clean things up and then you have the other person who's kind of like, at least I feel it, you're like the wild card that keeps adding uh, <laughs> cool uh, mechanisms and stuff and like the mechanism in Architects, which I think you're... Uh, probably most well well known for is that because it's such a great mechanism uh you know capturing workers and sending them to prison uh c- could you tell me about working with mechanisms that haven't been explored because like i'm i'm sure you got inspiration from somewhere for the the the, the mechanism itself but it it's not something that's been as explored and it's kind of new territory yeah uh so that was basically the original idea that was all i had Um, well two things together right um the first was i liked worker placement games i wanted a worker placement game where i could put as many workers as i wanted on a location right and i wanted the game to be fast and flowy and so all you do is you put one worker on your turn 
but then in a later round you can put another worker and then the more workers you've got there the more resources you get so it was this worker investment idea and i think other games have got hints of that i didn't know this at the time i think notre dame has got a hint of that but then in my mind, I was like, okay, that's going to be wildly broken. By the time someone's puts uh, five workers down there, they've got 15 resources. The six, mm-hmm. they've got 21, you know? It's yeah. out of control. And so it's like, there's a few ways you could limit this. One, you could just put a limit on it mm-hmm. or put a limit on players' number of workers that they've got. But that that wasn't fun. And so the idea that I wanted to have was, what if players balance um, how many workers each each other player has got on location. And so naturally it's like, right, we're going to round up people's workers, capture them, arrest them, and put them in prison. Like, where else are you going to put them, you know? Um, and so that idea, that whole kind of those two mechanisms together came to me one afternoon when I hadn't designed anything before. I'd only played a few Euro games. Um, like Shem showed me Raiders. I love Raiders. I played Citadels, Pandemic a few other games like that. And I thought, well, let's just, you know, draw this all up on a whiteboard, um, use some bits and pieces from other games and um, play this with some of my flatmates. And we played it that evening and everything else around it was kind of a little bit average and rubbish. But this core idea of investing workers and rounding up people's workers and then send them to prison for money was fun and it worked. And the game flowed super fast and there was a good level of interaction where it didn't feel really, really bad when your workers were sent to prison, but it was a little bit annoying because now you have to go and get them out. Um, that worked. And so that's always been there uh, from the start with Architects. I'm sure that sometimes uh, you get stuck uh, working on a game. Well, what do you kind of do when, when you're not sure what, what, what your game needs uh, to have changed? There's a few different stages of that. One is like take a break for half an hour you know uh just go for a walk something like that if no ideas come to me when i go for a walk oh by the way i love to go for walks so that's one of the things that inspires me and normally i'll go for a walk with my headphones on and listen to music or a podcast or something which is really really great but i found that if i take my headphones off and go for a walk then i've got silence and then my brain starts to work and connections start to be made and I start to mull over a problem and think about it and think about it and think about it and solutions sometimes come up that way. And I think the exercise might help a little bit. Um, but I'll go for a walk and if there's no solution there, then I'll leave it. I'll shelve it for another week, you know, shelve it for a half an hour, then shelve it for a week. And then I might talk to a friend about it. So there's Shem, but there's a few other people that think deeply about game design there might not even be published game designers, but I've got friends that I can talk to about stuff and they've come up with some really good ideas um, for me in the past. And so I'll talk with them about it, see if they can understand the problem and see if they can come up with another solution. And if they can't, um, then I just give the game more time. But I would recommend uh, working on another game and playing lots of other games and then eventually a solution might come up from other games that you've played um, and then you might be able to incorporate that back into the the problem area of the game that's causing you problems mm-hmm. I, I also <laughs> uh, have had the, I have the same experience almost every day because what I usually do is uh, I walk over to my brother's office which is where we uh, get together to make games essentially and usually I have almost no ideas until the, that 10 minute walk to that office. And that's when, when somehow I, I get all these new ideas. And I, I don't know if it's the, the walking or the just having that moment where you're, you're, you know that you're going to go and work on a game that day. You're kind of thinking about it, but it's not in front of you. You're, you're going through it in your head. And that's, mm. that's something that I, I, I found very... I just find that that's the moment when I'm like, why not try this in, in that game? Or why not? And, and that's when I, I, I kind of know what I'm going to be doing that day or what I'm going to be working on that day when it comes to game design. So, I, I, yeah, I think definitely it's, it's awesome. Yeah, it's it's for me, it also works the, the same way. Just have some time where you're, you're not really even thinking about the game, but uh, you're, you're just letting thought thoughts 
uh, come in and you're like, why not try this? Why not try that? Because when you have the game in front of you, I think it can even be a bit intimidating. You're like, should I change this? Uh, and you're going to have to yeah. like break break open. Uh, you know, you're going to have to maybe cut out a, some new stuff or like start writing stuff down. And it's it's something that I, I really like doing is just having that thought process and doing it in your head, which I've heard you talk about as well. Yeah, I play the game in my head. Eh? <laughs> yeah. What do you look for in other games when you play them? I love, okay, so one of the first things I'll look for in a game is when someone's explaining the rules, I'll be looking for, okay, so how do I engine build in this game? I, how do I improve my kind of economic engine? You know, I, even though the goal is always to score points, I want points to happen as kind of like a byproduct of improving my efficiency. Um, so I'll look for that in a game, right? Uh, like Terra Mystica, one of my favorite games. Uh, the more buildings that you've got out, the more income you're going to get each round. So I look for that. I'm like, cool. I want to try and maximize that. Uh, I'm looking for new mechanisms or it's it's really hard to find new mechanisms nowadays, but maybe it's new twists, new twists, like fresh twists on old mechanisms. I'm looking for that. Um, or ways that kind of two mechanisms are brought in together cleanly. I'm looking for variable player powers and unique ways of uh, making each player's experience different from the other players around the table. I find that so exciting because it makes me want to come back. I'm also looking for uh, games where you can develop mastery in them, where you play the first time and you're like, I could do so much better. And then you play again and you do better and you have this feeling of progression, of improving as a player. And I think that's a core human instinct that we want to improve, that we want to get better and better. And one thing I'm concerned about with the cult of the new, though, like I understand it, it's great to try new games, absolutely, is that players miss out on this uh, this excitement of replaying a game, a really deep game, where they can keep improving and getting better and better and better. I mean, that's why a whole, a whole bunch of people play chess all over the world is you can see how you're getting better and better and better. You've got the score next to your name. Um, and then you might get a title like Grandmaster. And so, yeah, I think this pursuit of mastery in games, especially deep games, is a really rewarding thing. Uh, because nowadays I feel like a game like chess would be quite hard to kind of sell just because of that. <clears throat> yeah. It's not, yeah, it's a learning curve, I guess, because because you, you're always getting, be always the better player will win against the... yeah newer player worse player and i feel like what you're trying to or what we're trying to do in this you know hobby uh industry is make a game that's v fun the very first time you play it and there is a learning curve but you also can kind of have uh newer players enjoy the game and have a chance to win so how how do you make it so that there's both a learning curve or both you get better and develop tactics and uh that that first game being being so important because usually that's what's going to uh make yeah. the the person decide whether they like the game or not whether they want to play it again or not whether they want to buy it how how do you kind of balance those two things out yeah i'm smiling right now cuz what you're talking about is exactly something i spoke about in this little talk i gave uh, on an online uh, conference a week ago. And so I talked about this pursuit of mastery being a great thing, how it brings us back to the game. But there is that dark underbelly, that dark side of the pursuit of mastery is what you've said, is the more experienced player is going to win. And so with tabletop gaming, we want to get, we want to sort of get beyond the solution that chess offers where you should just play with uh, the same people uh people of your level same skill level right you want every player to feel like they've got a chance to win from the start and that's a really hard thing to do if you're going to have a lot of depth in the game where players can improve and improve and improve and i'd say it's almost a, a cursed problem um but there are ways to sort of compromise and to deal with this problem a little bit so one of the ways is to add interaction to the game. So a game like Root or Risk or Dune 
for a cosmic encounter those games very um interactive games the way that they deal with this is there could well be players who are better at the game sitting at the table but these games say hey we're going to give every player some opportunity to balance the game and you too can pick on the player who's better or the player who's in the lead and you can bring them down to your level and so the more interaction you add uh, the kind of the less uh, experience is going to matter to a degree where players can pick on and balance the game state based on um, who's winning or not. So interaction is one way we can do it. Another way we can do it, there, but but there are issues that come with that as well, right? Then you have the, um, the king-making problem. That's basically what I'm talking about, mm -hmm. which can actually be good in some games, but we're not talking about that fully. Um, the other way you can deal with it is add randomness so and variability so that um, you can't play the same way each time. Like, um, for example, with architects, you might be really good with a certain strategy. You might love to go to the black market and you might have a strategy that revolves around getting the illusionist who means you don't lose virtue at the black market, things like that. Well, you can't be sure that he's going to come out, that illusionist card is going to come out. And so when you increase randomness, that's going to um, give all players an opportunity to do well in the game. And then um, apart from that, it, it's still a very inherently flawed problem where you have to come up with some sort of balancing act of giving players a little bit of a chance from the start, but you kind of do expect the best player to win. And so that is just part of games, how they work. Um, if you increase the randomness too much, you're left with stacks and ladders. Mm. Um, so yeah, I, I haven't fully solved this problem. Like, I mean, Paladins has this issue where it's really exciting and you can improve and you can get better from game to game. But uh, if you've played it 15 times, you're probably going to beat someone who's playing it for the first time. That's just the reality of it. So I can't say I fully solved it. I've just figured out some of the factors that you can um, play around with. Yeah, I think another thing uh, which can kind of keep players interested is when you do have when you give them the opportunity to explore different strategies. Like their first time around, yeah. they know that they went for for one strategy, and then giving the showing them that they could have gone for a different strategy. Like you said with uh, architects, you can figure out a way to kind of go evil with the black market and uh, and you know try that out as a strategy but you also are giving them so much choice as in you can focus on building that cathedral or you can focus on uh or recruiting people or there, there's a lot of different things where you you even though you might lose that first game because you're less experienced you're gonna see that next game i can try going this different route and i think that's something that that uh at least the first time i played architects that's what what got me kind of hooked was uh i knew that you know i, I tried being evil <laughs> and then i knew that next game uh i might try that again but then there, there there's a lot of options and I, I think that's one way that you've solved the, the problem uh what, what kind of uh games do you play now either board games yeah. or digital games yeah okay uh i'll start with digital because it's an easy answer uh, I play Age of Empires 2, Definitive Edition. So Age of Empires 2 is about a 20-year-old game, yeah, maybe a I, little bit older. I have played it a yeah. lot. <laughs> yeah, and uh, just like six, seven months ago, they released a Definitive Edition, so 4K HD graphics, like balance changes, a whole lot. They've put all this love into this 20-year-old game, and it's phenomenal. And um, it's blowing up, like it's doing really well. And I love watching um, pro Age of Empires as well. It's crazy how many clicks per minute, like their APM, these pro players are. They're just all over the map doing all these amazing things at the same time. But um, that game was actually the inspiration for Shem a little bit for the theme of the West Kingdom. So you start with the Vikings, they're in Age of Empires. You got the Franks who are in Age of Empires, Saracens and Byzantines, all of these um, ancient civilizations there. Uh, they're in Age of Empires, and they're also in our uh, four-part trilogy. We've only done two of them so far, two trilogies. Mm -hmm. I think it would be called a quadrology of trilogies, maybe. <laughs> yeah. I think Shem needs to come up with a better name, though. <laughs> <laughs> uh, 
so, and then board games. Okay, so I love Euro games, but I find them a little bit hard to get to the table. Uh, but I've just started up a game group recently. So we've played like uh, Great Western Trail, Maracaibo, Vindication, Terra Mystica, Orléans, all those sorts of games. We love them. Uh, and then I also really enjoy playing cooperative games, especially with my wife. So we play Gloomhaven together, Eon's End, Legends of Andor, and then fun games like The Mind and Wavelength and, you know, I'll, I'll play all sorts. And then I'll even be down for a game of Rex, which is like four to five to six hours on a Saturday afternoon with six other friends. Uh, it's really good fun. Uh, yeah, I'm going to have to download Age of Empires 2. I didn't know it, about that at all. And I haven't, I haven't <laughs> played that game in probably 15 years. <laughs> but it's one that I used to play so much as a kid that I'm sure I, I can. I will definitely get back into it if I uh, download it. <laughs> They've added like uh, 15 civilizations, so you'll be blown away by just the number of paths you could take, all these different, I guess it's like variable player powers, right? The, all these different civilizations, yeah. What would you say are some things you've learned and some mistakes you've made along the way? When you look back on games that you've published, or that you've had published with Garfield Games, is there ever anything you want to change? Yeah, I think uh, I'd be interested if you asked Shem this question. You might have. I but, think um... I might have, yeah. <laughs> I. I think I'm like a little bit more of a perfectionist than him. Really? <laughs> and uh, yeah, oh, like in different in different ways. Like he he's in, in in the sense of doing a rule book and making the rules clean. He'd be much more perfectionist than me because he just does it so well. So I'd make a lot more mistakes. But like a few months after Architects, I was like, can we fix this apprentice and this apprentice? You know, there, so there are a few apprentices that I think. Oh, I regret designing that one, you know, like it's just not quite strong enough. And, and so I want to change them. And Shem's like, it doesn't matter, man. Like it, it's, it's fine. And um, like his point, I think is that you need to have a few sort of average ones to make the special ones stand out a little bit more. Um, and that's kind of a natural asymmetry to the game, not asymmetry for each player, but just a natural you want some building cards to be better than others so that you get this aha moment when you pick up a cool one, you know? So that that's a um, that's a cool thing that I've learned from Shem. But I still look at some of those apprentices thinking, oh, I wish we could just tweak that a little bit, you know? Um, because I want every strategy to be viable at least, you know? And I think there are some strategies in Architects where the game's saying, hey, you can go this way, but actually it's no good because just the pure numbers on um, some of those apprentices are wrong. I'm talking about two or three of them. It's not heaps. It's very minor. Um, and then uh, like architects is, I'll talk a little bit more about architects because that's, I guess that's the one that we've had the most feedback on by far because it's been out for about two years. And so there's been a lot of plays. People, have a complete different perception of how the game plays depending on the group they play it with it's quite fascinating not all games are like this but i think it's because there is the variable game length and so if a whole bunch of players just build the cathedral which requires like the least resources um, but it fills up the guild hall faster basically then the game is going to be a much much shorter game i'm talking like probably half the length you could you could conceivably have about a 25 turn game of architects and you can have 50 60 turn game of architects and so those those are wildly different and so some things that are strong and good and cool in a 50 turn game of architects just aren't the same in a 25 turn game and so that is kind of a problem but it's not like we should tell the table hey you should play the game this way and, and I do like the variable game length as an idea because players have a bit of control. They can put pressure on other players. They can say, hey, the game's going to end soon. You better do something about it. And that is good. That creates tension and excitement. But it's when the group always plays the same way where the game length actually isn't dynamic and the game is just short and players don't get as much done as they would like to every time. That's where I think it's a problem. I don't know what I'd do to fix that because in playtesting, when we would play, 
we developed a meta of everyone would recruit all of their apprentice. They would get their engine up and running and then they would, you know, build all these big buildings. That was heaps of fun. And then every now and again, someone would rush the cathedral and we would have to adapt. And that was also fun, but we never um, really tested it in a way that everyone was rushing the cathedral and getting like 20 points. Um, that was just kind of inconceivable that it just didn't feel like the right way to play, but apparently for some groups they do that. And, and so I really hope they enjoy it when they play it that way, but um, they do have the power to play a different way if they would like, you know? Yeah. I think that's one thing that with, with play testing um, you, I, I, that's the reason I think it's so important is because we, I've fallen a lot of times in that mindset of playing playing my own game, playing it the same kind of way every time, because you kind of th see some patterns and you think that that would be the optimal way. But then, uh, when I watch playtesters, one thing I really like is uh, you you just they show you strategies which you've never thought would be good, and sometimes they even yeah. turn out really good, and uh, it, it just gives you that aha moment of. Uh, wow, I did. I didn't know the game could do this, <laughs> and yeah. I, uh, I I think that that's why it's so important to see other people play your games. Uh, when you do play tests, do you keep a design diary? We jot down we jot down everything that we need to and all our observations, and and we also do this with blind play testers as well. Though we mainly use blind play testers for. Um, testing the rule book like that's the main thing that it's for and so we we observe a lot of play testers and we we do a lot of play tests with different groups as well um yeah but not not strictly a design diary but we do note down um the things that we need to change i'll just answer the question i've just been thinking about it for um paladins as well um about things that we i regret or things i would change and with that I read all of the feedback, all the negative feedback for Paladins, and I just look at it and I nod my head and say, yep, I agree. But I wouldn't change it because the, most of the negative feedback would be it's long, it's lacking theme. I think the theme is good. I think there's setting. It's not necessarily immersive, but th there is theme, and I think I'm, I'm happy with that. But they'll say it's long, it's dry, um, you know, it takes takes a long time. I guess I've seen that multiple times. Um, and I'm like, that's kind of what we wanted to design. We wanted to design a big, heavy Euro game that's crunchy, that's a bit of a feast of a thing. So I agree with your feedback, but uh, no, I don't, I'm not, I don't want to change it. That's what it wants to be. That's the game. That's what Shim and I set out to design. So if that's not for you, I totally understand. I get that. Um, so yeah, I'm just, I'm happy with what we ended up designing for Paladins and I understand people that don't like it for sure. I think that's such an important, uh, an, an important thing because you, as a designer, I think, I feel like you have to stand your ground because your game isn't, oh, isn't going to be, um, loved by everyone. And you're not, I, I don't think you should be trying, trying to have your, your game loved by everyone because there is a, a, a such a thing as taste. Yeah. And if you're having a, a love and hate relationship from other people, and I've talked about this a lot, but I, I think that you're more on the right track. And also, uh, you should know what you've set out to do. Uh, you, sh you should know when to listen to people. If, if what they're saying is something that you want to be in the game, then go for it. But I think you, you really need to stay, stand your ground when you know that that's not what, what you're going for. Like... It might make it better for some people, but it's not what you're looking for in that game. I, I had some feedback about one of, one of our games, our, our last game, Satchel, where uh, I I had one person tell me that it didn't feel good that there's only a win or loss situation and you don't have like a, a point system. But that's exactly what we were going for going in. Is like we were trying to make a yeah. game where it's like I think it was it was very much uh, I was it was very much inspired by pandemic kind of. And from the, I, I tried to have that mechanism of pandemic, but in a random map, basically. So you would have, your your you would uncover the map. You'd have that exploration, and then you would either win or lose, based based on what you did. And that's that's one thing that I just did. I didn't want to have uh, keeping track of points being being some some part of that game. But 
again, uh, like I, I would like to have difficulty levels, you know. So that's that. That's a place where I, I felt like I, I stood, I stood my ground and said, I, I prefer not tracking those, those things. Yeah, stick to your guns. Mm. That's the thing about playtesting feedback is, um, it's super important, but sometimes the feedback will point your game in the direction that you never wanted it to go in. Maybe maybe every now and then that's the right direction for it to go. But often the, the playtester, when they say something like that, they're not understanding your intent for the game. And so really the feedback comes down to, can you make the intent clearer? Like why this is a cool thing and why the game is intentionally going down this path. Yeah, I think Shem, Shem made a, a good point about uh, watching playtesters... Uh, when I talked to him, he said that he he just wants to see the game played. He doesn't so much care about the testers themselves. As as, uh, yeah. as as strange as it might sound, you know, he, like like he also mentioned how you guys uh, test it sometimes only with with uh, automas. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, totally. against each other, which is is really awesome. We're nerds like that, man. <laughs> we keep a spreadsheet, and you know, we start betting on which Ultima is going to win. <laughs> now nah, the betting part's not true. But yeah. Uh, but yeah, I, th- I think that's that's a good point. Is watch the game and see if if it's if it's what you're uh, looking for. Because in in the end, you you were the designer. You know, you you were it's your baby and. <laughs> you're raising it basically the way that you want to anything that you want to add before we kind of come to a close uh anything in particular no nah, no nah, this is this has been heaps of fun not just whatever yeah <laughs> all right well cool uh tell me where where people can find out more about your games if you want to uh, like facebook pages twitter all that social media stuff yeah uh i don't i don't have instagram I don't have Twitter. I'm on Facebook just as a person. You know, you could add me as a friend, but don't just add me if you don't know me. Just sit, say a message. Tell me why you're adding me uh, <laughs> at the very least. I'm on Board Game Geek. You can talk to me there. Um, I've got a YouTube channel where I've got two playthroughs of my game solo, and I've tried to record Paladins twice, and for different reasons it's failed. So maybe in the next week or so I'll put up a solo playthrough of Paladins. Um, but if you want to find out more about my stuff, just check out the Garfield Games website. I, I, at the moment, I'm only working with Garfield Games. I love working with Shem. I love working with his publishing company. So I would love to keep working with them, you know, for ages. Uh, if I've still got ideas, you know, before I get all washed up and old and <laughs> keep reusing the same mechanisms. So yeah, uh, anything where you find Garfield Games, um, my name will be on some of those boxes, SJ McDonald. Um, I don't know what his website address is, but it would be easy to find. All right. Well, thanks a lot for uh, for taking the time to be on the podcast. I love talking to you. Thanks so much, man. It was a real privilege. Great getting to know you. Great meeting you. And it's just cool talking about design.